Welcome to the April edition of the East Zach Talks, our monthly youth-led conversations about cultural heritage. Today we'll be, we will be discussing the theme of world heritage challenges and opportunities. My name is Riley Marshall and I'm a member of the ESAC Coordination Committee and will be moderating our event here tonight. This is a friendly reminder that our event is being recorded to be later published on YouTube. So if you wish to remain anonymous, we kindly ask you to leave your camera off. The event will begin with an address from our keynote speaker, followed by the four speakers selected from the call for abstracts. During the event, we invite you to leave your questions for the speakers in the chat, and there will be a question and answer session for all speakers at the conclusion of the event. We will also invite you to, to ask your questions aloud if you're comfortable doing so. Following the, speaks, the speakers, we will have time for a breakout room discussion and we'll discuss the details further at the end of the event. So without further delay, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker of the night. We are delighted to be joined by Dr. Meshchild Rosler, the director of the UNESCO World Heritage Center. She's an expert in both cultural and natural heritage and in the history and planning. Dr. Rosler was appointed as a director of the World Heritage Center in 2015. She began working for the newly created UNESCO World Heritage Center in 1992, where she has held a variety of positions and additionally has authored countless books and articles. Dr. Rosler, we are honored to have you here with us this evening and are looking forward to your remarks. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction. And um, I wish to thank uh, Isa for inviting me uh, to be your keynote speakers for today's uh, talk session. And thanks to all of you for joining me as we discuss very diverse challenges uh, facing world heritage today and also discover many opportunities for a better preservation of the sites inscribed on UNESCO's world heritage list that have risen from these challenges. Now, um, today, um, heritage no longer means a single monument uh, looked after by a privileged uh, elite. Heritage today encompasses uh, industrial architecture, large scale landscapes, breathtaking mountain scenery or local dances or rituals uh, transmitted from generation to generation. Heritage today can be cultural, natural or mixed, tangible or intangible, old or new. Uh, the communities taking care of it have also been uh, changed fundamentally um, from central regional governments to NGOs, local associations, individual activists, all have their place now in a process that makes heritage open to all. Now, from site managers to specialized experts such as archaeologists um, or ecologists to museum curators, all the way to the millions of followers that we have at UNESCO on Instagram or Twitter, everybody can be involved. Everyone should be able to appreciate heritage. The concept of heritage has also evolved organically and has been interpreted over time and has truly become more open to all. However, we must learn how to manage it in an ever-changing world when the protection and safeguarding of heritage has become a truly global challenge. Needless to say that this global challenge has increased exponentially in the past year. We started 2020 with an unprecedented health crisis that affected all of us and each one of us. Not only have been touched in our, we have been touched in our personal lives uh, through the health, health conditions, lockdown has severely affected the way um, we work. Our communities and several industries um, uh, at times with uh, devastating uh, consequences. A whole year later, it's not nearly over yet. In a better, uh, in Inevitably, uh, our World Heritage Sites have been adversely affected and the abrupt halt in travel and tourism cut off visitors and revenues. For some sites, the only source of income to cover conservation maintenance and salaries of staff. And I have been just traveling myself to Egypt because I still travel. 
and I have seen how people also suffer because of uh, that situation. Although I have to say for myself, it was uh, quite a, a great experience to visit the Valley of the King or history um, of the Kings or historic Cairo without seeing uh, many tourists. The surrounding communities are affected as well, as many people lost jobs and sources of income, whether in maintenance, in local industries and uh, conservation. But this challenge um, is critical, of course, but it has also brought with it a set of opportunities. For many sites, uh, the halt in visitation and traffic meant a relief for natural areas. They recovered. And for some cultural uh, sites, rehabilitation and restoration, uh, restoration works uh, have been possible in a better way. There are sites that have been devoid of people for the first time ever, and drones were able to fly over them and film them in all their splendor, untainted by human presence. We have also seen a new focus on the digital heritage um, aspects of heritage, from virtual visits to online exhibitions or um, cataloging inventory of her um, heritage objects, which was much easier during these times. Now, the UNESCO platform, such as the World Heritage Journeys in Europe, uh, were already offering a means for people to explore world heritage from their homes. But now we have an even wider platform through the partnership um, with Google Arts and Culture, uh, which offers virtual tours uh, of over 50 world heritage sites. In addition, UNESCO has been monitoring the site closures and supporting site managers across the globe during the pandemic. And that I think was really, really important to keep in touch with these site managers. Now we have developed a digital map on the closure of old heritage sites due to COVID-19 and which we have been monitoring and updating um, over uh, continuously over the past year. And we have also created a platform for site managers to share their experiences um, of coping with this unprecedented crisis. Um, their messages have been those of resilience and hope. And I think that was also very important that they did not feel alone at their sites, but supported by other site managers and by, by uh, us as a community. Addressing the culture sector as a whole, UNESCO launched the Resiliat debate series in support of resilience of artists and to bring governments together to find policy solutions. We also launched uh, the culture and COVID-19 um, impact and response tracker to provide an overview of the sector's responses to the pandemic. Now, while we hope that the pandemic will soon be behind us and its negative impact on world heritage will be short-lived, there are many other pressing challenges uh, that face our world heritage, um, whose efforts will be much more long, um, uh, whose effects will be much more long-lasting if necessary interventions are not uh, made. The wars, conflicts, Intentional destruction have been a growing threat over the past years, and there is also ill-advised development, um, urban development, uh, often over tourism, pollution, poaching, uh, illegal logging, and the increasing impact of climate change. Um, and that I think you are very well aware of it because it's your generation alerting uh, and continuing to alert uh, uh, people also in the heritage community about this. Now, when the main characteristics um, for which a site has been inscribed on the World Heritage List are subject uh, of specific threats and dangers such as conflicts, pollution, um, even natural disasters such as earth, earthquakes or, or landslides, um, but ill-advised infrastructure, etc., then the inscription on a list of World Heritage in Danger may be a way to uh, address this. 
For example, we have five sites on a list of world heritage in danger uh, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, due to poaching, war and civil unrest. And you are all aware of the mountain gorillas that are very much uh, a threatened species. But so are the people uh, living in and around the sites. In the past year, uh, three deadly attacks have been uh, taken, uh, took place in the region uh, in April 2020 against civilians, park rangers in July 2020 against the armed forces uh, of the RDC um, and most recently in January 21 targeting the, again the rangers, those people who protect our most precious uh, heritage sites. Now, likewise, in Libya, the World Heritage Committee placed five sites on the danger list. Um, and uh, in July 2016, because of the threats and damage caused by the conflict affecting the country, and we worked very closely um, with the authorities to protect this heritage, but also, I have to say, with the communities. They were just great um, helping to protect these sites. Now, an inscription on the danger list um, should not be perceived as a sanction, as a blackmailing or punishment. It is a joint call for action. It's a call for international attention, meaning that the whole international community has to participate in the recovery and rehabilitation of these sites. And it's also a call for action by UNESCO to get funding for these sites in uh, priority. Now, we have a number of success stories. I personally believe we have not celebrated success uh, as much as we should do. Um, but we have sites like the Belize Barrier Reef uh, Reserve System, uh, Reserve System, and the Los Cateos National Park in Colombia, um, uh, where the local authorities and the communities did everything uh, to recover uh, these sites, and we managed to get them off uh, from the danger list, uh, and that was uh, really a great success. Now, um, on the future outlook, um, UNESCO has managed to mobilize communities globally and encourage people to get involved in preserving their heritage and in projects that enhance the cultural identity and the natural environment. Opening up prospects uh, for the future and for sustainable development um, uh, enabled uh, by a deeper intercultural dialogue, very much needed in all these conflicts, by a reconciliation among the different groups and regional um, and transnational uh, cooperation. This is one of the crucial messages also of the 2030 Sustainable Development uh, Agenda um, and uh, its goals and targets before the term sustainable development uh, was um, established in the global arena, the World Heritage Convention enshrined it already uh, through its inter, um, intergenerational uh, equity, because actually what we are doing, we are not protecting these sites, uh, these precious sites for ourselves, we protect them for future generations. Uh, so not for ourselves, but for the generations to come. And I think this is a very critical concept because you, uh, the future generations, should have uh, the same rights to this heritage as we have. Um, now, I'm sure that many of you also joined uh, ECOMOS and UNESCO in celebrating the International Day of Monuments and Sites, which we celebrate every year on, on the 18th of April. This year's theme um, was a complex past, a diverse uh, futures, and that I think speaks particularly um, to the uh, um, need for supporting inclusive and diverse points of view in heritage, identification, conservation, um, and transmission to the generations uh, to come, which has been our constant endeavor since the beginning. I also, it also reminds us that while sites are protected for their specific outstanding universal value, there may be other histories and other memories um, of very diverse uh, peoples around the world which have to be managed as well. 
Let us now talk about those who are most affected by the key development changes as partners and actors in a bigger multi-stakeholder initiative, which is youth mobilizing young people who play a crucial role for, a role for protection preservation of heritage is essential to building inclusive, sustainable and peaceful societies. We have um, seen that active participation in cultural life also provides young people with opportunities to broaden their horizons by highlighting shared histories and experiences sometimes also challenging us in our concepts of heritage and strengthening uh, the ability to resolve conflicts peacefully. And hence, use is our biggest opportunity for securing a sustainable future for world heritage. Reflect, uh, reflecting this, uh, Article uh, 27 of the World Heritage Convention clearly states the importance of educational programs in the protection of world heritage, which is the basis on which the World Heritage Education Program was established in 1994. And this program provides young people with the necessary knowledge, the skills, networks and commitment to become involved in heritage protection conservation from the local to the global levels. And through the, its diverse uh, range of activities, including international and regional youth fora, um, international volunteering campaigns, capacity building training and educational resources. The program aims to train the next generation of heritage practitioners and it gives a platform for them to highlight their views on the challenges and opportunities of the protection, conservation and restoration of world heritage sites. However, it's not just uh, about engaging uh, young people in protecting, preserving and promoting our heritage, it's also, it's also a two-way process. It's all about learning from you. As such, we are pleased to see that the same values are reflected uh, in ESAF's youth network, and uh, which is encouraging uh, an open discourse on heritage among all of you. As I'm sure you know, the World Heritage Convention was adopted by UNESCO in 1972 and celebrates its 50th anniversary next year in 2022. As we prepare for this milestone uh, event, we also pause and reflect on the constant conflict between preserving our past and moving on towards the future. It is the time for us to pass the baton to all of you, the next generation of heritage practitioners to explore new possibilities of heritage preservation. And this is especially the case for me, who was already involved in the 20th anniversary. You won't believe this, but I was involved in the 20th anniversary as when I was young, as you are, <laughs> of the World Heritage Convention in 1992. And who really wants to share the experiences, the heritage expertise and the stories with others as much as I can. That's why I'm very eager to hear your views today. It is precisely your approach to heritage preservation that will help shape the policies and the decisions of tomorrow. And as decision makers, you will be responsible for the future of this immense and diverse heritage. I'm sure that each of you will play a critical role in building peaceful, and sustainable societies through the protection, preservation and promotion of world heritage in the years to come. I wish you the very best with your own heritage journeys. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ressler, for your remarks. Um, it's wonderful to hear about the initiatives and the perspective of UNESCO about the challenges facing world heritage, and also wonderful to hear that the voice of, of youth is valued. Um, so thank you very much for attending and being here with us tonight. The next four speakers you will hear from are members of the ESAC network and were selected based on our call for abstracts. It's an honor to lift up the voices of the youth in cultural heritage and to be able to learn from each other. First up today, we have Vanessa Menendez. Vanessa is a PhD candidate in public international law at the University Autónoma de Madrid. 
She holds a double bachelor degree in law and political science and a degree in public international law. Her research is focused on the international protection of cultural heritage in peacetime. She will be presenting tonight her talk on rec reconciling Western and Islamic approaches towards the protection of cultural property. The floor is yours, Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, uh, Riley and Savela, for the uh, organization of, of this event. So um, can everyone look the presentation properly? All right. So when we uh, talk about the protection of uh, cultural heritage, the first question we have to ask is why it is important to protect cultural heritage. The axiology presented by Alois Riegel, it's a good starting point uh, to reflect on this matter. So according to Riegel, societies attach certain values to their cultural heritage, being remembrance or contemporary. Among the former, we have the historical value, which justifies the protection of cultural heritage as uh, a means for safeguard its documentary capacity. And this leads to the implementation of legislation and public policies aimed at ensuring the conservation in situ or with the minimum possible human in, uh, intervention of these cultural properties. This is the uh, perspective adopted by most Western states and also by um, the main NG, uh, international organizations uh, dedicated to the protection of cultural heritage uh, internationally such as UNESCO, ICOMOS, or ICROM. On the other hand, when we talk about the contemporary values, we have to highlight the instrumental value, which justifies the protection of cultural heritage as long as it serves a social function or it has a practical use, and therefore it reports a benefit for local communities. And this is the approach that was adopted by Islamic State, which uh, prioritizes its uh, restoration or reuse. So Islamic states uh, shape their cultural heritage legislation uh, according to the instructions in the Quran, one of the main concepts being the Akidah, meaning that nothing uh, material has, uh, some, has intrinsic value or it's uh, sacred. So this clashing between uh, these two values prevailing in the protection and management of cultural heritage has led to, uh, has given uh, rise to uh, several conflicts between Western states and Islamic states. One of the uh, most illuminating examples being the case of Saudi Arabia. Since 1926, Saudi Arabia has carried out the destruction of uh, more than 90% of the, um, of the uh, traditional quarters or the ancient quarters surrounding the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. While this destruction uh, has, um, was, was, has given rise uh, uh, to an outcry by some uh, states like Turkey and special rapporteurs of the United Nations on cultural rights and on the freedom of worship and belief, uh, on the other hand, the former Minister of Islamic Affairs excused these actions as being performed under the sovereignty of the Saudi state and uh, highlighted the fact that they, those sites that were listed in the World Heritage List were not touched, were not uh, destroyed whatsoever. And this is the example of the site of al hir Madain Sali, and it's the one that you can see in the, in the presentation. So, this case is helpful because it shows us the, the difficulties on identifying whether and to what extent some Islamic states uh, protect effectively their, their cultural heritage. And it calls into question our Christian historical perspective towards the protection of cultural heritage. But how possibly the War Heritage List has reconciled these two uh, different approaches towards the protection of cultural heritage. Well, here we have to make two main appreciations. The first one is that we have to draw our attention to the role played by Alexo, that it's the Arab League uh, uh, Educational Cultural and Scientific Organization, which took part in the meetings of the War Heritage Committee, unifying the Arab positions 
and also it uh, carry out the running uh, for international Arab, uh, international uh, support for Arab files uh, within this organization. And second, we also have uh, to take into account that insofar Islam uh, positively rates the uh, sciences and their developments, the conversion of archaeology into a scientific field uh, make the state more favorable to the protection or to uh, protect the archaeological sites. That protection that was later expanded to uh, the protection of antiquities and historic relics. And that's why when we see the World Heritage List, we see that most of the sites that were listed by Islamic states are historical complexes or are rooms. And this leads me to uh, the final question and that it's, do we really need to preserve and spend time and resources on those cultural properties that have ceased to have a social uh, function or that do not report a benefit for local communities anymore? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vanessa. And those of you in the audience will notice that each of our speakers tonight will leave you with a thought provoking question. Um, and we will post these later for you to be able to leave your responses if you would like to contribute to the discussion. Next up this evening, we have Alessandra De Masi. Alessandra is a PhD student in cultural heritage at the University of Bologna and is writing her thesis about the preservation of cultural sites exposed to hazards. She was part of the War Free World Heritage Listed Cities Project and is part of the staff at the Maniscalco Documentation Center. She is convinced that a correct conservation and valorization should start with a risk assessment and prevention. She will be presenting tonight how to design a risk preparedness plan. Alessandra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Riley. Okay, do you see my screen? Perfect. Okay. Um, so thank you everybody. Uh, tonight I'll show you how to design a risk preparedness plan for cultural heritage according to the second protocol to the 1954 Hague Convention. But what is the Hague Convention and why it's important when we talk about endangered heritage? The the Hague Convention was born uh, to find a way to protect cultural properties in times of hermit conflicts. I know uh, we don't usually uh, think about protecting cultural heritage from war, but we should. The Convention uh, distinguishes two degrees of protection, general and special. Then in 1999, a second protocol to the Hague Convention was adopted. It created the new category of the enhanced protection dedicated to cultural heritage uh, that has these features that you see in the slide. Uh, the guidelines for obtaining the enhanced protection um, imply developing plans related to uh, emergency assessment and management. So uh, basically the convention and its protocols are the first uh, legal instruments we have to keep in mind when we uh, want to protect cultural heritage from hermit conflicts. And they can be useful when we think about other hazards as well. An example of the application of the second protocol was the Ciudad project where free world heritage listed cities. The project goals were to develop an efficient risk assessment and management plan for the world heritage sites of the cities of Biblos and Mishketa and to grant them uh, the enhanced protection. Since I was part of the team uh, by the side of the University of Bologna, uh, tonight I want to show you what we learned from this experience. First, we learned that an efficient plan must consist of three phases. Uh, please remember that I'll provide you some examples, but the actions listed in an eff uh, efficient plan are many more than the ones you see with me tonight. Uh, so the first uh, phase regards all the preventive actions that should be done in peacetime to mitigate risks. Uh, some examples of these are planning actions as plan a security system, fire prevention or earthquake protection and so on. Train a specialized staff ready to operate as soon as the emergency happens. Sensitize uh, citizens to be active in protecting cultural heritage when needed 
identify safe areas as shelters and warehouses uh, if the movable heritage needs to be moved. But uh, a good plan also needs preventive actions that aim to the best knowledge of the heritage, because only through deep knowledge of the heritage you can choose the best action to protect it. Uh, so these actions are, for example, plan a monitor system of the heritage's conservation state and modifications and catalog cultural heritage using digital tools if possible. Then we have the second phase that regards the emergency management. During the crisis, we'll have to implement the preventive measures already prepared, alert the supervisor because they will organize the intervention of the specialized staff and volunteers, protect the immovable heritage and evacuate the movable heritage if necessary. The third phase regards the post-emergency actions, uh, such as check the catalogs, verify the structure stability, secure the damaged heritage, implement a preliminary restoration of damaged heritage, and if possible, return the movable heritage. Last but not least, we learned that to design a plan that can potentially deal with every critical situation, we have to keep in mind these three fundamental principles. The approach to each risk and object should be multidisciplinary. This leads to a better understanding of the problem and the more efficient use of resources. The cultural site should be conceived as a complex system with an unpredictable element of uncertainty and each site should be studied truly because uh, um, if we studied it from every point of view for example, his history, the story of his conservation, the list of emergency that it had to deal with during the century, we will be able to um, design an efficient risk preparedness plan. Following this guideline and adapting them to the peculiarities of the site we are working on, uh, we will design a risk preparedness plan that will, be, will uh, help us to mitigate risks and protect the site as best as we can. Just so, so we know in Mishketa we succeeded because in 2016 the UNESCO uh, site of Mishketa obtained the asset protection. So let me end with two questions for you. Which one of the three phases of the plan do you think is the most important? And would you like to suggest other useful actions in one of the three phases? Thank you for your attention and keep in touch with me if you want. Thank you, Alessandro. Next up this evening, we will have Yulia Eremenko. Yulia is a junior researcher at the Sociolog Sociological Institute at the Federal Center of Theoretical. Sorry. Good evening. In our presentation today, we will briefly discuss the impact of the conversion of Hagia Sophia into a mosque on its authenticity and significance. This will be done by critically, and critically analyzing the concept of authenticity. In July 2020, when the Turkish government announced that Hagia Sophia will be converted back into a mosque from a museum, it caused an uproar. Many news articles were written, as you can see on our title slide, that raised the question on the site authenticity, access, and its status as a World Heritage Site. Who will be allowed and when, when it became an essential and crucial question. It is important to mention here that Hagia Sophia itself is not a World Heritage Site. Instead, it comes under the historic area of Istanbul, who gained its inscription in 1985. The entire historic area of Istanbul meets four out of six of the UNESCO criteria for cultural World Heritage Sites, which I mentioned on our slides. Therefore, in light of these events, it was important to contextualize the ongoing debates and analyze the impact it may have. Hagia Sophia is historically and architecturally significant. Its architecture evolved over the period of time around its many conversion, riots, rise and fall of empires. Each of these historical events and conversion were done to prove the strength of the newly victorious. The conquest of Hagia Sophia was a political statement, a matter which it still has continued to date. The decision to change the function of the site into a mosque has deep political roots, raising issue on its authenticity and outstanding universal values. 
So according to e-commerce, the mutualization of Hagia Sophia preserves the outstanding universal value, as well as justify the inscribed status of being a world heritage site. But what is authenticity and how do we understand it in light of the existing charters and in the context of architectural spaces? As you can see on the slide, we believe that authenticity can be best understood in two main aspects. Number one, ontological authenticity, which can be defined as a congruence between the worldview of architectural space and worldview of the people who appropriated it. Basically, it refers to being true to the past through the present. And number two, authenticity of conservation, which can be best understood through the e-commerce New Zealand Charter of Conservation of Places of Cultural Heritage Value 2010, wherein the charter not only differentiates between the forms of conservation processes and practices, but also explains authenticity as truthfulness of the cultural heritage value of a place by acknowledging the tangible and intangible values that are attached with it. Then we also have the Venice Charter of 1964, the Rega Charter of 2000 and the Nara document of 1994. But these charters refer to authenticity only in terms of reconstruction for conservation purposes in a limited sense. Therefore, we have attempted to problematize how authenticity becomes an issue as part of the conservation process. Can one function of the site be more authentic than the other? For instance, if the function of Hagia Sophia as a museum is considered more authentic, um, an idea which was supported by ECOMOS and the Union of Chambers of Turkish Architects and Engineers, owing to its universal value and accessibility to all humanity, then by extension, that very idea implies that Hagia Sophia's functioning as a mosque would hamper the authenticity of its conservation. The argument then that is presented in favor of musealization is that it not only enables to preserve and maintain the architectural integrity, uh, but it also preserves the historical memory and the universal holistic nature of the culture shared by nations. Whereas on the other hand, the idea of musealization is also criticized to be ontologically inauthentic as it turns once a living heritage into a staged artifact. So the purpose of saying all of this is to highlight that authenticity does not have a single layer, but layers of authenticities depending on how the heritage site interacts with the humanity and how people localize the heritage as part of their identity and meaning making process. It could then be argued that the authenticity of Hagia Sophia is created, built and thrived around the communion of cultures. While we don't have time to go into details, in our paper, we also discuss the impact that change in purpose of a site may have on its historical, cultural, political, social, architectural significance, if any. In the end, we would like to leave you with the following questions. How do we really understand authenticity as it bears many layers? How do we understand not only our past, but also our present? What should be our position for intervening in the past? With regards of Hagia Sophia, is the principle of reversibility still possible? Has the authenticity of Hagia Sophia changed or is it still intact? And how do we as individuals make sense of world heritage sites in light of political interventions? Thank you. Thank you very much, girls. Certainly a timely and interesting example. And that concludes our four presentations for today. We will have time for a short Q&A session in just a few moments. Um, we invite you to leave any questions you may have in the chat. Be sure to address the speaker to whom your question is for so that we can um, efficiently handle the question and answer session. And while you're thinking of your questions, I would like to turn it over for just a second to my colleague Sabella for a few ESAC announcements. Thank you, Riley. I also wanted to thank you all because it's been amazing how well you've received this month's event. Um, I just have a few quick announcements today. One is that ISAC has opened a new section on its website where they will be posting job opportunities and upcoming events related to cultural heritage. I'm sure it will be very useful for our young community, so I just invite you to have a look at it. My second announcement is that our biggest annual event, this community in Madrid, is now open for registration. Due to the situation, this year it will be, it'll be running a hybrid way, um, both for those who want to attend in person and online. So we'll, it'll be a little bit different, but the program they'll have is still amazing. So I suggest you all attend. 
And I also wanted to say that the May ESAC talks are already underway. We will be talking about community engagement this time, and the deadline for the submitting abstract will be the 7th of May. And finally, I don't want to go without congratulating all those who participated on the photo contest we've held last month. Um, you've shown us a high level of artists we have in this community. So uh, just to say that the winners we have already been selected and they'll be announced in the next few days. So good luck to everyone. And thank you very much. That's all I have. Hey, I wish you, you enjoyed the event. All right, thank you, Sabella. Um, and just to add for any of you that have a questions, you're also welcome to raise your hand um, and speak out. We would love to hear from you in that way too. Uh, Carlota, do you have a question? Is that a hand? Hello, yes, yes. <laughs> um, I have a question for Mehdi, um, which is that where do you think that um, us as young people are especially useful or can especially contribute within the wider discourse of, of uh, world heritage and heritage conservation? What do you think we as a generation can offer that is sort of um, that we should focus on this on this issue? I think you can you can alert us to very very um, important questions. Uh, I mentioned already climate change because you will be uh, in your generation more affected. Uh, if you think of all the coastal sites we have on the World Heritage List with all the coral bleaching, you may not be able to see the Great Barrier Reef anymore as I was able to see it. So, and as there is this urgency, I think this is one of the most, uh, the biggest um, um, challenges of our time. But I was intrigued, if I'm also allowed to uh, intervene with the speakers, I was intrigued also about this question uh, about the clash uh, which was presented for um, uh, the uh, Hanseatic cities of Lübeck, uh, Wismar and Stralsund. And this is an issue we have actually in many World Heritage sites. We want on the one hand to um, comply with uh, the sustainable development goals. And I think, uh, uh, and this uh, answers Carlotta's question as well, um, because I see that there are great ideas, especially from young people, how we can uh, improve the situation uh, in terms of energy at uh, World Heritage Sites. But you have also clashes with the history of these sites. And um, I think the speaker, she came from Russia. Uh, we have uh, experiences there where, um, uh, for example, at Solovetsky Islands, um, there is a, a generator with, um, uh, with diesel, uh, which we don't want to have there anymore. It's a sacred place. So we are looking forward to great ideas of how we can improve the situation um, uh, at the site because it's a sacred site. We don't want to have noise, etc. Um, but we had at many World Heritage sites uh, also problems with wind farming, especially solar panels as well. We have seen that. Um, but I think new technology and great new ideas of younger people um, will solve that issue in the very near future. Because I've seen, for example, there are new solar panels which look, look like um, uh, the traditional roofs, you know. And in the very near future, I think we can use that. And it's always reminded me of my father who was 80 years put solar panels of the roof in our family house and um, I thought my god was 80 years he's thinking of that now we benefit from it and we produce so much energy that we give it back to the city <laughs> Thank you very much for your comments yes um, when I collect the data in Germany I'm always uh, a member of University of Bamberg in Germany. So for example, in Bamberg, they have a great idea that if you are um, a member of the city center, you have a, a house or flat in the city center, you can uh, rent a solar panel 
on the roof of uh, the school what out of the World Heritage City Zone. And it's wonderful that you can still use this uh, energy, but not uh, destroy the historical view. But not all city administration have such an ideas and they want to put their energy on. It looks like we have a question in the chat from Abigail. For the last presentation, do you think the reverting of the Hagia Sophia back to a mosque has made the building more authentic to those specific users, being able to use their religious space again? Or should the whole history of the building be celebrated, keeping it as a secular building? I think that maybe the Western view of authenticity sometimes neglects the end user's experience of the buildings and sites that are important in their cultures. Um. I can answer that question. Abby, first of all, it's really good to see you here. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it's a very interesting question. And uh, to be honest, there is no one answer about it or no single approach that you can go about answering this question. But what I think is that it definitely hasn't made it more authentic, right? But it definitely has stayed, stayed true to its purpose. The original purpose of Hagia Sophia was uh, it was a religious place. It was first a cathedral, then it became a mosque, and then it became a museum, and now it's back to a mosque. So I personally feel that the the function, the original function of the mosque has not changed. And in a way, it hasn't really affected its ontological authenticity. But when it comes to um, the social significance of the place and how people really um, perceive it, that it's hard to tell because um, it definitely, so by converting it into a mosque, it somewhat represents one single group in a way, because uh, before it represented uh, a secular state, uh, which everybody could access. But now since it has become a mosque, it has somehow homogenized the entire experience. But uh, even in that way, we can't really say that the authenticity of Hagia Sophia has changed because it depends on how people really interact with that place and uh, how do they perceive the space um, in that um, in their own um, way. So that's my answer. I'm not sure if it really helps to answer your question, but I don't know if Valentin or Chijin want to add something to that. Um, I would like also to add that due to COVID, it's quite biased now. We don't really know how people can use it. And due to the lack of tourism, um, also we don't have enough time to look about what happened and how really everything was put into place. Normally the Turkish government said that they will just cover the mosaics during the prior time and then uncover them. But that's what we try to work out is how many hours, how many minutes this place could be open again. So that's a big change. And it was it was a place that was chosen to be a museum because it should be represented the three pillars of new Turkey that Atatürk decided, which is modernity, secularism, and belief in science. So I think it's still a question that needs many, that as Shira said, could have many answers. I would just add one more thing to that. The idea to convert Hagia Sophia into a museum itself was a political agenda. Uh, Atatürk had a vision of Turkey that he wanted to celebrate. And that's how the whole idea of Hagia Sophia Museum came into being. And uh, I was going to say one more thing, which I completely forgot right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, what was it? Um, yes, I was saying that the idea of a museum itself is um, also, you have to uh, think of it in a very critical sense, because when you are changing something into a museum, it involves a selection process. And that selection process also has, is very political. It depends what you, it's basically your agenda that you're putting out there. What you choose to be in a museum or what you make it to, something to be a museum, has to go through a certain process and uh, that can be criticized as well. So yeah, I don't think that either as a museum or as a mosque, uh, the authenticity has changed or there's, there was one authenticity, but then again, with layers of it. That's excellent. Yeah, I was just, you know, food for thought and, and playing devil's advocate there of, you know, 
what if the end users, you know, find it more authentic? But these are both great answers. Thank you. Thank you. And I see a hand raised in the audience. Giovanni, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for your really interesting talks. I have actually a question for Macphil, if, if, if I can. Um, but it's relating also to the talk that uh, Vanessa did. So maybe she, she could jo join and step in my, um, for, for answering my question, which is, so I, I think that today, one of the major threats, if not the major threat for uh, European cultural heritage is the unused. So the loss of a function. I am I'm thinking specifically to, for example, cultural heritage that is relating to religious heritage. So uh, some heritage from the past, I think of church monasteries and uh, our heritage from the Catholic uh, continent, but everything can be applied to every other uh, religious or spiritual uh, related heritage. So my question is, uh, what do you think that are the best strategies to preserve through action? I mean, preserve the heritage because you live that heritage and you find and you find again a new social function to that to those sites. That's that's also the, the like the provocative uh, counter question to the question of Vanessa. Like, do we need to preserve uh, the sites that have ceased to have a social function? Maybe we should say. Should we find a new social function to those sites as a way of preserving them? Um, thanks a lot, uh, Giovanni. I was also intrigued by the, those uh, points which were raised uh, by Vanessa, but there are uh, two types of answers. One is whether or not a site is on the World Heritage List, you know, because there we got uh, the obligation, whatever happens um, uh, in that uh, heritage site, uh, that we need to protect it for future generations. And then uh, if it's a city center where you have, of course, churches uh, inside and there may be no community anymore, uh, you need to find adapted reuse. Uh, this will be, as you say yourself, a huge issue in many European cities. Um, I know it uh, from the land of Notre Dame Westphalia, where they need to find reuse for about 70 Catholic churches in only one of the 16 lenders of, of Germany. So I know that this is a major issue. Um, uh, in terms of Vanessa's question, um, we need to protect sites even if they don't have the social function anymore. Um, uh, and maybe there are new functions coming. Uh, think of uh, the heritage of the past. Look at the Buddhas of Bamyan. Uh, this is a Buddhist site, but there are no Buddhists living in the valley. And so for the community in the valley, um, that changed. And for them, this was a prince and a princess, you see. So heritage changes over, um, over time. And if you look back, uh, many of the sacred places in Europe, if you look at some of the Say, uh, the, the Celtic hills, the Catholic church built um, um, uh, little churches and, uh, and chapels on top of those sacred sites, uh, places. And there may be sacred places in uh, a thousand years to come, you know, but uh, it's different groups using uh, those sites. So there is, um, I cannot go into detail, but there's a myriad of answers and you need to look at a case by case um, on this. Thank you. Uh, yes, I, I agree with the both of you, actually. I think uh, we shall uh, look for more reuse uh, or reusing strategies for heritage, even though I consider that Europe is very conservative, I would say. And all this case uh, came to me because I was reading a case about Egypt and uh, UNESCO telling Egypt to cut the water supply in one of the main fountains that they have in the city center. And it was pointless for, for Egypt to conserve this um, specific cultural property without this uh, use, fundamental use. Uh, so I do believe that um, we have to uh, look for uh, social usage, usage for, for cultural heritage, but um, I, I, I don't 
think there is a unique strategy because I, as, as I said, there are different values that are attached to the cultural heritage and these values are changing all the time. And such the, the, uh, also the label of what we mean in cultural heritage is a, a, in a given time. So um, I'm sorry, I don't have a, a state question, a state answer to your question. But um, yeah, I invite you to continue reflecting on that. Thank you. All right, and I see another hand raised in the audience. Kritika, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, a uh, great presentation. I'm Kritika from India. I'm currently a student who's interested in heritage preservation. Um, the question that comes to my mind after looking at the Hagia Sophia uh, presentation was that, uh, you know, there are so many layers to its context and uh, its history, basically. And right now it's being used as a religious mosque. But uh, have there, is there an example whereby, if not converting the whole structure into the museum, they have retained aspects, not covered up? I think it was mentioned that certain previous aspects of it being used as a church was covered up. But uh, if we are talking about having um, evidence in place for the lay people to look at it and recognize that this had a preceding history than its current use, then is that provision made in the Hagia Sophia or um, they've completely erased evidence of what it was before? And in, are there any other examples in sites where uh, such kind of tangible evidence has been left in place? Because for visitors or for people who use the space who may not necessarily be students of heritage, um, science or preservation, you know, even for them, like, easy enough for them to interpret it and understand that this has a very complex layered history before. Yeah. Martin, do you want to answer it? I don't know, go ahead first. I'm getting my thoughts together. <laughs> no, uh, thank you for that question, Kritika. Um, they haven't erased, as far as my knowledge goes, and uh, because this is still a very novel um, issue and we're finding out things as uh, time goes by, uh, they haven't really erased um, any of the evidence from the past. As Valentine mentioned, they have just covered it, and that is only during the prayer times. Otherwise, uh, tourists are allowed to come into the building um, and uh, visit the site uh, as it used to be when it was a mosque. Uh, but there are certain areas uh, where tourists are not allowed to go anymore. I think which is the central dome, uh, which has which is now uh, been closed off for tourists. But besides that, they haven't really done anything to erase that uh, multiple histories of the past. Um, and as far as the example and other examples go, um, the one thing that comes to my, the one example that comes to my mind, even though it's not, uh, it, we cannot really compare it to Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, uh, but there is the Mosque Cathedral of Cordoba, which is also a contested site. Um, it was first a mosque, but then it was later shifted to a cathedral, and now uh, it's a Mosque Cathedral of Cordoba, which is also, in a way, a museum. Uh, so that is one side uh, that comes to my mind. Uh, but I think it is important to mention here that Hagia Sophia in Istanbul was the uh, was basically the last Hagia Sophia in Turkey to be converted into a mosque. Before that, the other Hagia Sophias in Turkey, which were already converted into mosque much before the one in Istanbul. So there was already a precedent uh, for the Turkish government to follow. Um, so that's what I have to say. I don't know, Valentine, if you want to add to that, or Jujin, if you want to say something to that. No, I think I wanted to mention the code of amp, but he did it, so that's perfect. Yeah, well done. Uh, did we, I don't know if you answered your question well, uh, but yeah, that's far our knowledge goes. Thank you so much, that did help. Thank you. Um, and I see another hand raised in the audience. Minamo, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for all of the interesting talks. And I am uh, Minamo from Japan studying a master's in sustainable heritage management in Ophus in Denmark. And I have a question to, uh, I'm sorry if I pronounce wrongly, but Dr. Mestid, 
me still. But also, I'm sorry if I'm, uh, but they also um, maybe some other speakers can add something as well. Because I've started studying heritage last year and then I'm, I've, been interested, I've been interested in tangible, intangible value as well as uh, authenticity, as well as like local, national, global or universal value and stuff. But today, when we look at the word heritage, because of COVID or because we are trying to be inclusive, I think the authenticity as well as the user of heritage is more and more become local. And so it's maybe too huge question, but do you think actually world heritage or such a thing could be possible because because all the for instance the authenticity in the west and then in the east or like in japan is completely different or like not completely but they're really different and when you try to include include all of those different value do you think well the heritage is a possible or like universal uh, universe outstanding universal value is a possible thing I mean, I wish it. I wish it is, but I want your opinion on that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, I give you a short answer. There is a very long answer, but I give you. Uh, I try to be short on the answer. Um, World heritage exists. There is no question about it, and outstanding universal value exists. However, for each of the World Heritage um, uh, sites, you have many other values which need to be managed by the site management. I remember there was this book by Di Giovine um, about heritage in Asia, criticizing UNESCO that um, uh, we are not, we are not uh, looking after the real values of Angkor, which have to do uh, uh, with the, um, uh, the Khmer regime and uh, the killing fields of people, um, uh, killing of people, etc. Now, while we understand this, this is not the outstanding um, um, uh, universal value of the, of the site. Uh, the site is really linked to the architectural uh, history. You know, that's the outstanding universal value. But of course, there is a, a museum nearby uh, at the boundaries of the site, which um, talks about that dark history, the memories, which is very important for the people. So in my view, you can manage these um, for all of the World Heritage Sites. And actually you have to, because um, uh, this is, is really critical. Um, on authenticity, I have a very specific view, and this relates to the other paper we just have heard. In the very, if you go at the early discussions on the World Heritage Convention, there was no mentioning of authenticity at all. There was one single term, integrity, and I'm very glad that I have part of this movement to bring integrity for cultural heritage into the play, because in my personal view, it, it's the notion which is applicable to all heritage around the world, and authenticity is a very very specific contact, uh, concept which is being interpreted again over time as we just have heard in, in the presentation. So that's a short answer to <laughs> where I have many more things to say, <laughs> many things. Thank you very much. I would love to hear the longer answer as well, but I guess the time is not allowed. <laughs> but really, I appreciate your answer. Thank you. And we have a question in the chat from Miriam um, for Yulia and I think any other speakers that would like to chime in. And it's about um, Milan in Italy. And the question is that the old city views have been changed by the construction of uh, modern buildings. And how does this affect its authenticity or cultural heritage? Thank you very much for this question. It's a really interesting question because um, I have the same one few years ago when I collected uh, the, my research data and I asked experts what they think about it because the needs of modern citizens are different than the need, for example, from 18th century citizens. It's completely different technologies, completely different life. And they told me that um, we have some, uh, for example, in Wismar Streisand, they have some empty spaces due to them was destroyed due, um, in, during the Second World War. 
and they want to create some buildings um, in, in, in this place, but they don't want to create them as they was before, but they want to have a modern buildings there, but they have a lot of restrictions. Uh, how this building should look like, how high it should be, and other things. And then when you look into the city center, you find out that, yes, there is a modern buildings, but they look, um, they have the same style, even if they glass and metal, but they look completely um, ethically, um, culturally uh, good together with the old monuments. And it's a really interesting idea, for example, in Bambek to create a buildings. Um, uh, for example, there was a library, really old one, and they create a part of it with a glass and metal. And you can, uh, after a few years of using, you just can uh, take it out and the old building will stay the same. And this glass and metal construction will go out. So if they don't need such a huge library, for example, after 50 years, they can uh, they still save the old building and they can uh, redesign this part of the city too. So I think in Milano situation, um, I'm not really familiar with, but um, in general, modern buildings uh, as uh, new inputs of um, to the to the cities, it really depends on what what style and how how they look like and how the citizens what they thinking and feel about them, because uh, even in a city without world heritage status, some building can destroy and uh, the view on the more uh, in the streets or in the city center. Thank you. All right, this has been a wonderful discussion this evening. Are there any more um, final questions in the audience? Carlota? I have one question for Julia, which is that just to clarify if I understood this correctly, because you were kind of saying that in a way, the World Heritage status, even though it's something that is supposed to preserve the heritage for the future generations, right now it is used as a short term thing because it promotes tourism. So even though World Heritage is supposed to be a long-term thing, it is seen as, a, as an opposite to sustainable development, which is also a long-term thing. Um, is this correct? Do you have any thoughts on these, on like sort of the, the, the term of action of World Heritage versus sustainable development? I think the first point, for example, that uh, World Heritage status and tourism, it's always together. It's not really like this. Okay. Because, uh, for example, I have um, a research in Velikinovgorod, it's a city mm. in, in, in Russia, and in Pskov, it has a status too, not long ago. And if you compare with other cities around, what have better infrastructure for tourism, for example, hotels and mm. parks, and they have more tourists than uh, Velikinovgorod, Pskov, even if they have the status. So it's not only about the status, uh, this... Um, Tourism development, it's step by step work of uh, city administration, business, uh, citizens. It's not only the status. If you think that uh, if one day you will have the status, millions of tourists next day will come to visit you, this is not exactly the truth. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the second part of your question was uh, about. Um, sustainable development programs and world heritage uh, cities. Um, my main point was that city administration, um, in, in my cases, as I think that uh, nowadays and in time perspective, it's better to uh, implement world heritage uh, city status mm -hmm. and uh, they use it uh, as an argument why they don't want to have the sustainable development programs. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not right. always exactly about the status, it's about their decisions, what they arguing, meanting by the status. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really uh, depends on, on them and the citizens if they really think uh, and they have a knowledge. It's, 
in a lot of cases, it's really about expertise. If the citizen have expertise in world heritage cities, as for example, as I mentioned in Veliki Novgorod, when citizens create the application, there was a part of um, application for the status, they know better how it works. And then they can uh, answer the city administration knows this, this is your decision. It's not uh, connected with the world heritage status. And in other cases, uh, they don't have such a local expertise and it's more difficult for them to, uh, in this conflict situation, to say uh, that they want to have something different than uh, city administration. Okay, thank you. I hope I, I answered <laughs> your, your question. Can I and just I say... We... Uh... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, a, a little clarification about the strange aspect that Milano has, because I'm Italian. <laughs> and I know that maybe uh, our cities are a bit strange for you to see because um, they have a strange aspect because after the Second World War, um, we have a great discussion about, uh, at, at, at academic level, about restoration. And we have a first phase uh, when we restore, ev restored everything, we said uh, where it was, how it was. So you can see um, new buildings uh, uh, just that, that looks that look just like the older one. Uh, then <laughs> we uh, passed another phase when we decided that uh, no, uh, we can't restore everything uh, where it was, how it was. We have to um, keep uh, the history of the destruction uh, of the sites. So uh, our cities are a bit uh, look a bit strange because uh, we passed. Uh, uh, on through all these phases of uh, theory of restoration. Thank you. Now it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think we have time for one more question. And Amelia, I see you had a question. Yeah, yeah thanks, Riley. Um, so my question is for Matilde. I've seen um, over the past World Heritage Committees that there's been a tendency to rule out the or not take so much into account as as it would be beneficial um the advisory body recommendations and i was wondering if do you think there's anything that could be done to restore these technical aspect of the decisions um so for example instead of pushing inscriptions because sometimes state parties tend to push inscriptions to be done um when they, a deferral would actually give them more time to prepare the documentation and the management plans better. Do you think there's anything that could be done to restore this part of, of the technical aspects of the decisions? I think this is a really important point you are, you are raising and we are working very hard um, to get back to the respect for um, advisory bodies, um, uh, evaluations and for mm -hmm. the expertise while uh, keeping in mind that uh, this convention is an intergovernmental process. There's no doubt about it. Um, but my personal view is there is never a rush uh, needed for inscriptions. These sites are for eternity. So what is the difference mm -hmm. it makes uh, of one year inscribed or not? <laughs> and also my second point is that um, you should use the opportunity when uh, governments put in money and lots of expectations, use the opportunity to get it right, get the management plan, etc., cetera, um, uh, which is needed. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually for the inscription. Now, as there is a growing uh, politicization, as was stated uh, by the General Assembly and by the committee itself, uh, so I'm just quoting, um, uh, there is now a new process which is going now into the next committee to change the nomination process and to make a preliminary assessment prior to sending in a huge dossier. So actually only those sites which really make mm -hmm. sense to go into the process. And that avoids a lot of um, anxiety among local people as well. And uh, among uh, and also lots of funding and effort which um, may not be uh, very well placed. So there is some hope for the future, but I don't know what the outcome will be. 
Thank you. Looking forward to watching the live stream of, of the committee. <laughs> Yulia, did you want to make a point? Yeah, can I have a question um, to Dr. Rosler? Um, I have a question about expertise in world, uh, world culture heritage, because uh, nowadays um, there is a few conception about who is the expert in world culture heritage. Is it all of us or some special people? What kind of people? Uh, can decide uh, what to do with a culture heritage, what is a culture heritage uh, and special world, um, world heritage cities, what's more important for me, for my research. And my question is, for, what for you is an uh, expert of world culture heritage? Who is this person? <laughs> For me, there's only, I mean, uh, there's heritage expertise and there's specific world heritage expertise. You shouldn't forget that the convention is about both natural and cultural. Mm -hmm. And actually, this is very precious because it's the only instrument where you have that and where you can actually learn from each other. And I give you an example why you should learn from each other, because we worked on, with IUCN on environmental impact assessments long before the convention was created, but with e-commerce on cultural heritage impact assessments only since 2008 because and i'm saying that knowing uh, it may be a little bit critical what i'm saying i always had the feeling um, that in the cultural heritage field there was a delay of 10 20 and in this case more than 50 years coming up with those tools so um, that's a personal belief I have. It may not be shared by uh, many other people, but uh, it's from my experience. And now in terms of the specific expertise, which is required, normally at the World Heritage Center, we have experts in cultural heritage, which could be an archeologist, an architect, an urban planner, etc. And we have experts in natural heritage. Uh, that could be a, um, a biologist, geographer, geologist, whatever. But then you have to learn either hands-on working at the World Heritage Site or in the system or um, doing additional studies on how the system works. And uh, I am now 30 years working with this convention, it has become extremely complicated. When I have new people at the World Heritage Center, it normally takes a year to understand the process. And it's very complicated. I know. I'm aware of it. And that doesn't facilitate then the debates at the World Heritage Committee, as you can imagine. Thank you very much for your answer. And if it is possible, um, I will ask you a few questions, maybe by email or some, somehow, because I'm now writing my research about expertise in world culture heritage. So thank you very much for, for this answer. It was really helpful for me. Thank you all for your participation in the question and answer session. I think this was wonderful for us to, to have the learning experience from each other's questions. And so I wanna give a big um, thank you to our four speakers and to Dr. Meshchud Rosler for joining us today and for engaging in the discussion after the event. Um, unfortunately, we have run out of time to have our breakout rooms as normal. Um, and so in lieu of that, we will email each of the participants that registered through Eventbrite the topic we had planned to discuss and come up with a way for you to provide your input um, so that we can understand your, your thoughts and opinions on world cultural heritage. So um, on behalf of all of ESAC, I would like to thank every one of you for attending today and hope that we see you again at an event in the future. <laughs>